Winter was always the worst time in that city. In autumn, the trees along suburban roads were venerable but elegant. In winter, they were gnarled and ragged ancients with rheumatic knuckles and bones. The large houses became drafty and tired to heat. The young children on their way to Miss Tyler's ballet and dancing class in Moldworth Hall wore garters over thick stockings and top coats over jerseys and shawls, so that when they alighted from trams and cabs, they were recognisable because of their enormous size. In the mornings just at breakfast hour, the poor searched diligently in the ash bins of the well-to-do for half-born cinders and carried sacks and cans so that as much as possible of the fuel might be salvaged. The ash bin children were pinched and wiry and usually barefooted. They lived on the cast-offs. They came each morning from the crowded rooms in the cast-off houses of the rich, elegant Georgian buildings which had grown old and had been discarded. The clothes they wore had been cast off by their parents who had bought them as cast-offs in the second-hand shops in Little Mary Street or Wine Tavern Street. If the well-to-do had stopped casting off for even a little while, the children would have gone homeless and fireless and naked. But nobody really thought about that. These things were. Fitz heard Larkin again that night and wondered at the magnetism of the man as the crowd cheered and the flares of the torchbearers tossed about the platform painting shadows on hungry faces that peered under peaked caps. Most of them had empty pockets, bare rooms to return to, bread and tea to kill hunger with, and no assurance of strike pay or any kind of relief. Yet they cheered when he said he could promise them nothing except hardship, and felt that somewhere at the end of the road, there was a better world waiting. Like heaven, it was very far away, and like heaven, it would be very hard to reach. Yet where before the only certainty had been obscurity and want, now at least there was that hint of hope. Hope for what? Fitz, in the calm after the speech-making, could not quite remember. He could only remember that it had been there, that it had infected him in company with thousands of others crushing and jostling and listening. Perhaps it was a feeling of movement that remained a journey beginning, a vague but certain purpose. In Dublin City in 1913, the boss was rich and the poor enslaved. The women working and the children hungry, when on came Larkin like a mighty wave. The workers cringed when the boss man thundered And seventy hours was their weekly chore They asked for little and less was granted Less given little they'd ask for more Then on came Larkin in 1913 A union man with the union tongue The voice of labour, the voice of justice and he was gifted and he was young God said Larkin in 1913 A union man with a labour tongue He raised the workers, he gave them courage He was the leader and the worker sung In the months of August the boss man told us No union man for him would work we stood by Larkin and told the boss man We'd fight or die, but we would not shirk Eight months we fought and eight months we starved We stood by Larkin through thick and thin But foodless homes and our crying children They broke our hearts and we could not win